Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Hallberg, and I'm very happy to be with you all here today. Um, we are going to talk about type 2 diabetes reversal, but first I want to take a moment to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me, especially Dr. Mariella Glant. So let's begin. So first, I just want to say there are really three clinically proven ways to reverse type 2 diabetes. Bariatric surgery, very low calorie diets, and low carbohydrate diets. But my talk today is very specifically, as I'm sure does not surprise you, I'm going to be focused on low carbohydrate diets. So let's go through what we're going to cover um, in a pretty quick manner today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about low carbohydrate physiology and history when it comes to diabetes. We're gonna talk a little bit about what is a low carbohydrate diet, which I think is really important and touch a bit on beta hydroxybutyrate. We're gonna do a very brief literature review just because of time. Uh, talk about some new results in our ongoing um, IUH VERTA trial. Um, and we're going to also talk about the American Diabetes Association guideline change before wrapping it up. So first, I always like to talk just um, very briefly about insulin before I begin any lecture um, when it comes to type 2 diabetes because, and I'm sure that this is not a surprise to anyone here, insulin is so key to the pathophysiology of this disease, but also again in how we can reverse that pathophysiology. So we have to remember that insulin is our fat storage hormone and that this can be high for decades before someone is diagnosed with even pre-diabetes. So I want to review this really all-important um, slide, which is the macronutrients that we consume, they cause very different reactions in insulin and glucose responses. So just to remind everyone that everything we eat is a carbohydrate, a protein, or a fat. And when we consume these things, there are very different responses, hormonal responses and glucose responses. When someone consumes carbohydrates, their glucose and insulin increases. And we know this happens even in people who are in normal metabolic health. We know this because of some studies that have been done recently utilizing continuous glucose monitors, which have been a wonderful addition to um, clinical research in diabetes. Of course, when someone has metabolic disease, the rise in glucose and insulin with carbohydrate consumption is greater and it lasts longer. The interesting thing also here is what happens when we consume fat. Fat does not cause a glucose or an insulin rise in people who have diabetes or normal metabolic health. And this is really important to understand so that we can understand not only disease progression, but understand how to reverse disease as well. So I just wanted to illustrate this with a couple more slides. And so of course, we're all used to seeing and hearing about glucose tolerance tests. And we see again, glucose rises after we uh, consume um, the uh, liquid in a glucose tolerance test. But we're not so used to seeing what happens after a fat tolerance test, after consumption of just fat. And again, we see just what was seen on the graph before. That does not cause a rise. Critically important. And here is an interesting um, study um, that was done looking at a standard diet, carbohydrate-free diet, and fasting. And the uh, line on the top is a standard diet. The line on the very bottom is fasting. And what is really interesting is what happens with the carbohydrate-free diet. 
it almost exactly mimics fasting. And again, that is why oftentimes, especially a ketogenic diet can be called a fasting mimicking diet, but of course, without the fasting. So it's important also to know that low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate diets are not a fad diet. This has been around for a very long time. And in fact, low carbohydrate diets were used um, even by the father of diabetes, Dr. Joselyn, before we had injectable insulin. And I love this, which is a picture of a um, early 20th century medical textbook. Um, showing what physicians should recommend their patients with diabetes to eat and not eat, which of course looks an awful lot like our typical low carbohydrate diet in the year 2021. So once again, we are really starting to see a change to remember what we used to know, which is very exciting. All right, so what is a low carbohydrate diet? And I just think that this is probably one of the most important slides in my deck. And that is because this is a source of so much confusion. And we see researchers say that they've studied a low carbohydrate diet all the time, especially authors of prospective cohort studies, when in reality, it's not a low carb diet whatsoever. So what is, like, what are the appropriate definitions? A very low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet generally has less than 50 grams a day or less than 10% of consumed um, calories from carbohydrates. Low carbohydrate is 51 to 130 grams or less than 25%. The important thing is anything over 25% is not a low carbohydrate diet. That is a moderate carbohydrate diet. So when hearing news or reading the literature, it's really important to go in to see exactly what they were talking about and if they're using definitions appropriately. So what goes into a well-formulated ketogenic diet? Very quickly. Again, it's not a carbohydrate-free diet, and that's really important. There are carbohydrates in them, and they come from a variety of sources. So this is not, again, a diet that is low on micronutrients. Um, really important to know that there's actually a published study and plenty examples of following a well-formulated ketogenic diet that is actually micronutrient complete. You compare that to, at least in America, our national dietary guidelines for Americans, and there is not a single micronutrient complete um, meal plan offered. Um, and in fact, the only way they can come close to it is by recommending five serving of refined grains, because of course those are vitamin fortified. So we hear people talk about, oh my goodness, we're not gonna get enough nutrients um, with a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet. And actually, again, it can be very readily done to be micronutrient complete. And part of that is because it's not no carbohydrate, but it's low carbohydrate. And so also important to understand that fat that forms the ketones comes from different sources depending on where a patient is in their journey. When people who, especially who have weight to lose, begin a ketogenic diet, initially a lot of the fat coming um, uh, to, uh, excuse me, coming that goes into the liver to make ketones comes from fat loss, um, which is obviously desirable at the beginning. But once people get to a maintenance phase, what we see is actually to have access to enough fat to make the ketones, the fat content of the diet actually increases quite significantly. So again, beginning, fat often comes when people have weight to lose from their body fat and the fat content of the diet does not have to be as high. As people get into 
um, ketosis long term and reach their goal weight, the fat content of the diet actually increases over time. So really quick also when it comes to ketones and concerns about this um, because of diabetic ketoacidosis, it's just really important every time we talk about it to stress that this is a totally different um, uh, um, thing than diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, this graph looking at where nutritional ketosis begins versus where ketoacidosis is. I and mean, this is a huge difference. And in fact, it's really hard, even in someone who is so good at following a well-formulated ketogenic diet to reach above 3.0 um, millimoles of beta hydroxybutyrate. You really have to be doing the diet and it needs to be post exercise to reach those levels, which of course are nowhere near a concerning level of beta hydroxybutyrate found in diabetic ketoacidosis. So um, again, when it comes to beta hydroxybutyrate, which we see often in a very low carbohydrate or well formulated ketogenic diet, we see that it's not just the carbohydrate restriction itself that can help with type 2 diabetes reversal, but we also know that the beta hydroxybutyrate produced at a very low level of carbohydrate consumption is also a really potent anti inflammatory. And, you know, this um, has been shown not only in many clinical trials where we can see the result of biomarkers, but the basic science of the anti-inflammatory aspect of beta-hydroxybutyrate is also well understood. So I wanted to just really quickly go over some of this clinical data here, which is a study um, done by Jeff Volick's group actually quite a while ago. This has been around since 2008. And they compared a low carbohydrate diet to a low fat diet. And what they found was seven uh, different inflammatory biomarkers were not different between the two groups, but seven were significantly lower in the low carbohydrate group. Again, an example of the clinical evidence that we have um, that a very low carbohydrate, car carbohydrate or well-formulated ketogenic diet can be a potent anti-inflammatory agent. So we're going to breeze through the literature review here very quickly um, because many of you who may have seen me talk have seen this before um, and I want to get to some of our new um, uh, results from our clinical trial, but I think there's an importance to mentioning some important studies here. Um, because the question is asked, is there really science behind carbohydrate restriction um, for insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, or any kind of problems with metabolic health? And I think we all accept at this point, I mean, I think by all, I mean, I think the medical community generally now does accept that the answer to this is absolutely yes, there's evidence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But here's a study that is a um, study from 2005, but I always think it's really worth mentioning because it is a great metabolic ward study by Bowden et al. that just shows how promptly carbohydrate restriction works when it comes to diabetes. So once again, this was a metabolic ward study for three weeks. Patients were fed the standard American diet for seven days and then low carbohydrate, which was a true, very low carbohydrate diet for 14 days. And there was no calorie restriction. So all food was weighed and measured, but they were allowed to eat ad lib. And of course, we know that the majority of low and very low carbohydrate diet studies um, allow patients to eat ad lib because we know that due to the fat satiety people get, the consumption tends to be much lower without having to direct it. 
So again, this graph really says it all. I mean, if we take a look at the black, these are the standard American diet. And again, important to stress that the blue line is on a very low carbohydrate diet after only two weeks. It does not take long to have dramatic results. And why is this important? Honestly, it is important more, I think, than anything, because patients can see this right away, and it's incredibly motivating. They don't have to start something new and then, like in the past, wait months, you know, maybe even longer to see results. Patients see results right away, and it's a big driver to continue on because they know they're making a difference in their health, and they can also as was seen in this study, see a difference the next time that they go to the pharmacy in lower cost and less medicine. Because as seen here and as seen in many studies, medication was decreased and eliminated. So um, this is another study, again, taking a look at um, a very low carbohydrate diet versus a low glycemic index diet. And this is from Eric Westman et al. And it's still a really important study in the literature um, because, again, the um, thought was for so long that the low glycemic index diet was what you needed to do and was adequate enough um, to get a reasonable control of diabetes. But again, when we change our goals from control to reversal, what we see is the low glycemic index diet um, as uh, seen in this study is not enough for reversal, but a very low carbohydrate diet is. Once again, no calorie restriction, uh, low uh, carbohydrate ketogenic diet performed much better in decreasing glucose and also significant elimination and reduction in medication. Again, when that happens, that's reversal, okay? We don't need the medicine anymore. And that's where our goals really need and should be based on the evidence. Um, this again is a, another great study from Laura Saslow. This is looking at 12 month outcomes of a randomized trial, uh, looking at a very low carbohydrate diet versus a moderate carbohydrate diet. And once again, what we see is much more success in the very low carbohydrate diet. And um, I want to bring this study up because I think we all know that glycemic excursions um, and understanding what's happening with a patient postprandial is becoming more and more important as more studies are showing that this is directly related to increased cardiovascular risk. So this was a study by Tay et al. Um, and one of the important points was that they did look at glycemic excursions and they found that glycemic excursions were significantly decreased in the low carbohydrate diet. Um, and again, we're going to be starting to see, I think, more and more studies of this kind looking and comparing um, glycemic excursions um, with all different kinds of dietary patterns and even post-bariatric surgery. So I think keep your eye on any study that comes out looking at glycemic excursions. Number one, we know that they're an important glycemic um, or excuse me, cardiovascular risk marker. And number two, what we know right now is that it seems that low carbohydrate diets, and I don't think this surprises anybody, um, significantly reduce glyce glycemic excursions due to not having the postprandial rise. Um, so I do want to touch base really quick on just metabolic syndrome um, instead of type 2 diabetes. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of studies here um, from Dr. Jeff Bullock's group um, looking at metabolic syndrome 
um, with a low carbohydrate and low fat diet. And again, in these earlier phases where we really want to catch people before they even progress to type two diabetes, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet um, can be a significant factor in improving um, uh, glucose and reversing disease. So again, here is the makeup of the two diets. And here actually, again, is the markers of metabolic health afterwards. And again, the red is the low carbohydrate ketogenic diet and the low fat diet. And again, we have, you know, markers of metabolic disease across the board here. But just a couple of things, of course, that I want to draw your attention to is just how significantly HDL cholesterol rises and how significantly triglycerides decrease um, with a low carbohydrate diet and how surprisingly total serum saturated fatty acids, which I have spoken about before and would love to have the time to get into deep here today, but we don't, um, saturated, uh, serum saturated fatty acids actually decrease with a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And we can see that here compared to a low fat diet, which of course would be the opposite of what everyone would think. But again, one other very important point on, um, disease reversal, um, and disease prevention as well as, um, serum saturated fatty acid content um, has been associated also with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So again, the second one by Dr. Volek um, and, and his group looks at metabolic syndrome again. Um, and um, at baseline, everyone who started the study had metabolic syndrome. And then they were put on a month um, in a randomized crossover design, a low carbohydrate, moderate carbohydrate, or high carbohydrate diet arm for just a month each. And what we see is a significant number of people after only one month of carbohydrate restriction actually reversed their metabolic syndrome. And certainly we see that more successful than in the moderate carbohydrate and the high carbohydrate arm. And the really important point of this study is that these people did not lose weight. They were fed their food and they were fed enough to keep their weight stable. And unlike some other studies that we've seen who have attempted this, um, when studying a very low carbohydrate diet, um, they were successful in keeping uh, weight stable. So without any weight loss, again, and only a month of carbohydrate restriction, um, a significant number of people were able to reverse their metabolic syndrome. And again, want to point out, going back to that serum saturated fatty acids, again, what we see here is in the low carbohydrate diet arm, you can see here on the left in both when we're talking about uh, phospholipid or um, triglyceride serum saturated fatty acids, the low carbohydrate diet group had the lowest level certainly much lower than the high carbohydrate diet arm in each. So yes, a very high fat, um, well-formulated ketogenic diet can um, uh, decrease serum saturated fatty acids. Very important point. Um, I think this is the last study I want to talk about. I do think it's really important because this was, um, again, mostly put forward as a Mediterranean diet, okay? But it was actually a Mediterranean low-carb diet, which is, you know, especially in many uh, cultures, you know, the um, most appropriate diet for people to be following because it helps keep their traditional food um, uh, on the menu. And so um, this is a great um, abstract illustration that talks about after 18 months of a Mediterranean low carb diet versus a low fat diet, um, what happened to hepatic liver fat. 
um, or hepatic fat concentration. I mean, very important here. And what we see is a pretty dramatic difference um, between the two groups. Again, when we also know talking about cardiovascular risk reduction, which is always important when we're talking about patients with metabolic disease, um, that the uh, hepatic fat concentration would indicate a much lower um, uh, cardiovascular risk in the patients who are following the Mediterranean low carb diet. So again, because I don't have time to go over all the wonderful studies, I did want to point everyone out um, just how the eating patterns stack up on evidence for diabetes. Um, and there are many more low carbohydrate diet trials um, uh, than other eating patterns. And so I want to point out for a further um, uh, and more in-depth uh, look at the literature, um, we published this paper um, that has studies of all eating patterns that have been um, endorsed uh, in the past by the American Diabetes Association in table form so people can very quickly understand what the literature um, shows between all the different eating patterns. So now I want to get into our um, uh, VERTA trial outcomes, and I'm just going to breeze through this because many people have heard of this trial before. Um, but this was a five-year prospective, non-randomized, but controlled for the first two years uh, trial that began in August of 2015. And um, so there were almost 400 patients in the treatment arm. Um, and then a control arm as well, treated by usual care who were seeing um, diabetic dietitians. Now, a couple important points from this trial I always like to mention is the starting BMI was over 40. Um, and the average uh, time since type 2 diabetes diagnosis was eight years. So again, many trials who are looking at at lifestyle management of type 2 diabetes, they generally tend to um, have newly diagnosed uh, diabetes uh, included in their patient population only, um, and they exclude patients who are prescribed insulin. But we had, again, over eight years since type 2 diabetes diagnosis on average, and we included a significant number of patients who were prescribed insulin. So retention is very high, um, again, much higher than we see with prescribed medications at one and two years. And we also know that the patients were doing what they were being asked to do as far as content of their diet goes, because they had an elevated beta hydroxybutyrate level that was maintained um, actually uh, was the same exact level at two years as it was at one year. So um, once again, we saw from the very first study that we talked about, A1C improves rapidly and continues over time at two years. And what we can see here again, oops, excuse me, um, is the high degree of uh, diabetes reversal. At two years, 55% of patients had reversed their diabetes. And that definition is that they had brought their hemoglobin A1C below the recommended uh, or below the diagnostic threshold for type 2 diabetes and were off all diabetes-specific medications. Again, just a quick overview, 91% of insulin users reduced or eliminated their insulin at two years. We had a 10% average weight loss and 74% of patients were retained. And again, medication reduction, again, um, is seen uh, across the board. Everyone was off their sulfonylureas. I mean, you can see how many people actually had insulin eliminated. Okay, so again, very significant as far as medication reduction goes. And that, again, is part of the whole idea of reversal. You don't have the disease anymore. You don't need the medication. So a question we get a lot is what happened to the 40% of patients that didn't reverse, okay? Um, and this is what happened at a year. This is a post hoc analysis of our uh, one-year data. And what you can see here is that it's 
hardly like these patients were not very successful. They just didn't meet the strict criteria for type 2 diabetes reversal, but they still had significant improvements, really, again, across the board in their health. Um, another thing is that markers of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease we know in our study significantly improved. Um, and we can see here at two years, the um, uh, liver fat scores continued to drop. Really important as we know again, um, fatty liver disease is also a significant risk factor for cardiovascular um, disease. And so uh, again, this is from our one year cardiovascular risk study. And what we see is that the only thing in our study where things um, got worse, we could say, is that there was a rise in LDL-C. But again, remember that we LDLC is a calculated value when we get a real measured value, which has, I think, wide acceptance now that ApoB or LDL particle count is uh, a preferred way of looking um, at lipoprotein uh, risk in patients with type 2 diabetes, especially. They did not change. Across the board, everything else got better. I mean, everything else got better, including things that we have a lot of difficulty managing medically, um, like decreasing triglycerides as significantly or increasing HDL cholesterol. And again, important, we also saw that significant decrease in inflammatory markers, both white blood cells and C-reactive protein. And wait, because before too long, we're going to be having a much more um, broader look at uh, inflammatory results in our study. Um, but now I really quickly want to show um, a, a little bit of the results from our two-year cardiovascular paper, which was recently published. Um, again, here is the paper. A uh, quick summary, there was no change in LDLP, ApoB, non-HDL, and cardio or uh, CIMT um, in the study, which is critical to push back against um, the idea that this uh, type of eating pattern, despite all the other improvements, is going to increase someone's cardiovascular risk. We saw again the rise in LDLC, but this is really thought to be because these are now larger um, cholesterol filled particles instead of the multiple small cholesterol depleted particles. And the decrease that we saw at one year in triglycerides was maintained. But here's the bigger part of this study, which is just what happened to the patterns um, in the lipoproteins tested. And again, what we have is we have baseline here at the top. A over here on the left side is the um, intervention group. B is the control group. We can see where they were um, with a um, high predominance of pattern B, um, which is not what we want to see, the uh, small dense um, pattern um, at baseline, and take a look at what happened after two years. I mean, a huge difference in changing the LDL phenotype pattern from a high risk pattern B to a much lower risk pattern A. And so that's really one of the major take homes from this study. And I also want to take a quick peek at our um, preliminary results from three and a half years. This was presented as an abstract form um, in 2020 at the, Amer at the Endocrinology Society. Um, and uh, so again, diabetes prescriptions are staying down, A1C is staying low, and body weight uh, loss is being maintained significantly, even as far out as three and a half years. We are wrapping up our five-year data collection, and I'm be very excited to bring that to you um, sometime, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future. 
Again, really important to know that during our trial um, and in our intervention group, our patients not only were instructed on what to eat, but they were given significant support, um, all remote care um, through a healthcare team that consisted of a health coach and a physician for each patient. Um, I want to uh, wrap this up before conclusions, just talking about the fact that low carb is now standard of care, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. So important that a number of organizations now endorse a low carbohydrate eating pattern. We see this uh, happened in 2017 from the Veterans Association, our Department of Defense guidelines. Um, in 2019, the five-year consensus report from the American Diabetes Association, and again, the standards of medical care in 2019, 2020, and 21. Again, just taking a quick look at the VA and the Department of Defense, carbohydrate intake uh, as low as 14% endorsed since um, 2017. Uh, an important quote from the consensus report from the American Diabetes Association, again, talking about carbohydrate restricted eating pattern does not appear to increase overall cardiovascular ris uh, risk. And again, more studies to show this have been published since this time. And again, I just like to highlight some of the important things that what we see here over time from the um, uh, standard of care is that the language endorsing um, a low carbohydrate eating pattern has actually um, strengthened. Uh, once again, here in 2021, um, drawing attention to the fact that medication reduction, um, uh, and certainly we know elimination, um, may very likely be seen. So conclusion, carbohydrate restriction is a viable patient choice for type 2 diabetes reversal. Nutritional ketosis supports diabetes reversal by reducing insulin resistance while providing an, an alternative fuel to glucose with favorable signaling properties. Of course, that's beta-hydroxybutyrate. Low-carbohydrate nutrition patterns, including ketosis, have a extensive clinical trial evidence for type 2 diabetes improvement and reversal, including our study at one and two, and again, a preliminary look at 3.5 years. And the American Diabetes Association and other organizations have updated their guidelines to include a low carbohydrate eating pattern for type 2 diabetes treatment. And we hope that the actual um, uh, ability for them to say the word reversal um, will occur soon because we certainly know and have evidence now that that is what is happening. Thank you so much um, again for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I look forward to the questions and the panel. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah Hilbert, for being here with us. My name is Maya. Um, some of you might know me from uh, mainly the diabetes online community. Um, I help run uh, the group Sayer uh, Zaket, which loosely translates to Diabetes Patrol um, online. It, start, it was started with uh, by Asaf Feldman. So thank you everyone for being here again. And thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to have some questions, uh, some things that at least I was thinking while watching your, uh, your talk. Uh, you mentioned, and I think that's something that's, a, that's sort of a term that's a lot of people use in our community, especially um, just anti-inflammatory, the anti-inflammatory effects of low carb or, or the ketogenic diets that they have, especially on, on you know, when, when people uh, with diabetes. Um, so I don't know if many people really know uh, what, what, is, what is inflammation, like what, what does it do in the body uh, and why should we reduce it? 
Um, well, there's, there's a di two different kind of types of inflammation, really. There's acute inflammation, like, you know, I get punched in the arm and I get a big bruise and that's an acute inflammation. Um, or there's chronic low level inflammation. Okay. We don't s necessarily see this. Um, it's going on um, uh, all over. It's, it's systemic. Um, and it is chronic low level inflammation is required for basically all of our modern chronic day diseases. And so like take cardiovascular disease as you march through kind of the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease. It's like step by step before someone, you know, develops full blown significant cardiovascular disease. But every step, each progression that is taken in the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease requires inflammation to be occurring. OK, we don't we're not able to march through to get the cardiovascular disease at the end. OK, unless we have this baseline chronic inflammation at each level. Um, and, you know, you can say that with other diseases as well. I mean, when it comes to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, of course, is always number one on everyone's mind because um, it's the uh, uh, most likely cause of death in people who struggle with diabetes. Um, so we really do uh, need to take note of chronic inflammation. It is very important. And the, the great thing about looking at a um, ketogenic diet, um, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, we know two really important things. Number one, we know clinically that we see the decrease in inflammation. We have many studies that look at biomarkers of inflammation and have found that they decrease, not just the typical biomarkers, such as a high sensitive C-reactive protein, but other markers like white blood cells. I mean, we, a whole gamut, IL-6, you know, there's, there's just a, a ton of different ways you can look at chronic low level inflammation. And, um, a well-formulated ketogenic diet impacts so many of those. So that's clinically, you know, you put someone on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, their biomarkers for inflammation go down. But the other thing that we have is that we understand the basic science of this too. So, you know, being able to take, okay, what is happening clinically and tie it back to something very specific from a basic science standpoint to deepen the understanding is also something that's available in the literature. Um, so again, um, I think that people do need to be paying attention to chronic inflammation. Um, it is very important in the chronic disease process. I think it, it gets a lot of attention, both clinically and in research, which is great. Um, and we understand not only that it does uh, decrease with a well-formulated ketogenic diet, but why? All right. And so you also mentioned, uh, you know, LDLC versus LDLP. And we know right now, 99% of doctors rely on LDLC, um, which for, for those who don't know, these are the, just the, 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 the small particle versus the, the large particles that is, that's what's tested with the LDLP. Um, and most, most doctors rely on that as a major uh, cardiovascular uh, disease predictor. Now, what, what measurement would you use? Well, probably at least here in the States, and it really depends on what is available, but probably the cheapest um, uh, and, and best thing is to just get an ApoB on people. Um, an ApoB um, is a measured, a directly measured, um, takes into account all the atherogen, potentially atherogenic particles. Um, and for us here, instead of relying on an LDLC, which is you know, notoriously problematic when it comes um, to people who struggle from type 2 diabetes. In other words, when diabetes is really out of control and triglycerides are up, the LDLC is actually falsely low, okay, which then isn't really helping as a biomarker. And if you improve those things, it can actually rise um, without there real being a uh, difference in the measured value. Um, you know, if you don't have access to ApoB, um, 
then a non HDL cholesterol would probably be the preferred way to look at it. Although that definitely does have its limitations. And of course there's NMR technology, which can give you the LDLP and even an ion diffusion, which is uh, limited in you know, where that can be done. Um, but that gives you a real specific look at what the size of the LDL particles are. Right, uh, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so one of them is, so if uh, BHB is important, is it uh, advisable to increase it with things like bulletproof uh, coffee, for example? I guess it's like just increasing your ketones any way possible. I, I think that's a great question that we don't really have the answer to yet. I, I, I don't think we um, understand in, it with exogenous ketones or with things like MCT oil or coconut oil and things like that. Are those advisable to add strictly to increase the beta hydroxybutyrate? Um, and I wish that we had a definite answer for this, but we don't yet. And I think that what we're going to find at the end of the day is that there's a lot of personalization. I mean, where do people need to be on their beta hydroxybutyrate level? I mean, the answer is probably different for person A than person B. I do want to remind everybody when it comes to taking a look at levels of beta hydroxybutyrate that have made a difference, we've learned something from you know, an unexpected source, and that is from study of the SGLT2 inhibitors, right? So in the studies where we saw improvements in cardiovascular outcomes, specifically heart failure, um, and then of course, newer ones looking at um, kidney disease, um, the ketone levels there were lower than we all think of generally when it comes to nutritional ketosis. They were somewhere just over 2, 0 0.2 millimoles, sorry. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, we may find out that different levels are going to be beneficial for different people, but this remains an open area of investigation. Would you say that, um, what, what should we prioritize? Because I'm hearing a lot of, you know, talk about um, ketones and uh, there's a lot, you know, a lot of people ask about this, but should, should we not prioritize blood glucose? Uh, over ketones or what, what, is, what is more important? Oh, I, I mean, I would prioritize blood glucose over, you know, right now that, that I would say is, a, is critical for anyone who's struggling with type two diabetes. You know, what's going on with your glucose is important and that's, you know, what I would be following. Um, and, you know, our goal is to try to get up, you know, uh, to 0 0.5 millimole. Um, but for some people, again, if they're really frustrated and they're struggling and they're like, I just can't get up above a 0 0.3, you know, the fact of the matter is that may be just fine and be able to be giving you the benefits. And I know everyone, you know, it, it, it's almost like a competition and, uh, you know, oh, look at my beta hydroxybutyrate levels. Well, you know, I, I ask everyone to take a deep breath on that, okay? Um, you know, uh, check out your blood sugar. Remember the progress that you have made, you know, um, uh, medications that you may not be needing anymore. And although we want to try to get the ketones up, again, there is very likely um, heterogeneity involved. And so what is a goal for one person may be different for another. And you also showed, or you, you demonstrated uh, in some of the studies that uh, weight loss is not necessary uh, in order to really experience better insulin sensitivity or to improve the metabolic syndrome uh, when, when you use a low carb diet. Uh, like what, can, can you, can you tell us more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's been shown in multiple studies now. Um, and so I think that again, when we talk about goals, when it comes to someone with type two diabetes, again, it's glucose first and weight is later. And I understand that can be frustrating to some people who know that they have a significant amount of weight to lose 
or have a predetermined idea in their mind of what specific weight they want to get to. Okay. Um, uh, but I still say that the priority would be glucose um, and uh, getting that in range and being able to reduce medications. And what we see in weight loss does vary. And we know it doesn't have to be part of the mix from studies um, in order to improve metabolic health. So for, you know, my biggest recommendation is don't get so caught up in weight. Weight does generally come down um, with a well-formulated ketogenic diet at different rates for people, and there may be stalls in it and then restarts again. But I would always focus on the improvements first and foremost in metabolic health. All right. So um, again, you, you demonstrated so much evidence in support of uh, low carb diets, uh, just as a way to treat or even reverse uh, diabetes. Um, and yet, even despite the ADA's incorporation of it into their, their recent guidelines, why do you think so many in the medical field still uh, opposed to it, like very openly opposed to it? Um, it's a lot of intellectual bias, I think, is still there. Um, and so our job, I, I mean, what I consider my job is to just continue to put out good research, just continue to, you know, um, improve the amount of literature there is. And, you know, the science will speak for itself. I mean, people are arguing so many um, uh, oppositions to this that don't make good scientific sense. And I think if we all just stick to the science and the evidence, you know, the, that will um, change minds over the long haul. Intellectual bias is very difficult, um, but instead of being argumentative, we just need to continue to go back to say, what is the evidence? All right, we have another question from the audience. Um, so how much of the effect of a uh, very low carb diet is due to just the glucose restriction versus fructose re restriction? Well, that's another great question. Um, uh, I think that certainly they both play a role. I mean, we know fructose, especially when it comes to fatty liver disease. I mean, a lot of the results that we're seeing in um, hepatic fat concentration in our specific study on li liver um, uh, fat markers, um, I think a lot of those are probably due to a decrease in fructose. And I guess my big point to say to that is, you know, we're reducing both of them. So right now, until we get even more sophisticated, you know, with our understanding, parsing out which one would be okay and which one wouldn't be okay is less relevant at this stage of the game, as in when they both come out, um, diabetes gets better. Right. Um, let's see. We have another question. Um, I have another question. Uh, Somebody's talking here about a recent study that was published about the use of ketones. And again, we're, we're talking about um, ketones versus uh, glucose control. Um, so the use of ketones is a treatment of heart disease, but the authors claim that ketogenic diet is um, not a good treatment, but the ex uh, exogenous uh, ketones should be used. Uh, have you seen the study and can you comment on that? Um, I think I just read the abstract of the study. I have not read that study in full, so I'll, I'll keep my, you know, um, comments more general than specific to the study, which is, I mean, exogenous ketones may have a really important role to play um, uh, it, for some people. Um, once again, when it comes to criticisms of endogenously produced ketones, um, uh, you know, we, we see a lot, again, of that intellectual bias fear of, of this um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, which has never um, been proven out. Um, 
And so I would say, you know, endogenous ketones are obviously associated, production of endogenous ketones are associated with so many other things that are good for the heart and the rest of the body and improvements in many other biomarkers. Um, exogenous ketones. Bones, I do feel are going to have their place. It's just not very easily spelled out. And certainly one study is not going to show that we should be doing exogenous versus endogenous. So I'm not sure the strength of the language that said that. Um, but, you know, I would certainly uh, disagree if it was um, uh, strongly worded based on one study. We just need more evidence. Okay, so uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Sarah. You, you're Absolutely. great. And thank you, not just for being here, but for um, all of your fantastic work and for being uh, such a strong advocate for low carb uh, diets as a way to treat diabetes. Um, you are in the forefront. And so we, we all appreciate it. So again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I think we're going to move on to our panel. Um, I'm very, very... Let me just say thank you so much again, though, real quick for, for having me. It was wonderful to be here, and I appreciate everyone who's helped organize this. Thank you to Mariella um, for putting this together, um, and I, I think it's wonderful. So i um, just so glad to have another resource. Thank you. Yeah, we need we need more of those. Um, this is so this is so great, and I'm I'm so excited right now because we're gonna have a panel of um, not only uh, people who are um, patients who are being treated uh, exactly as you recommend and are seeing tremendous success, but also. Um, uh, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Richard K. Bernstein, who is um, a personal hero and a role model of mine. Um, he uh, had type one diabetes himself for over 74 years now, I believe. Um, and again, as somebody who, you know, a type one myself for 35 years now, this month, um, it's just uh, he, an incredible uh, inspiration. And so thank you so much, everyone. And I'm so excited for this panel. Um, thank you. All right, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we have uh, an eclectic, different type of panel this time. I really thought it was important um, to bring a, a, a little bit of a different perspective from the other great leader of um, diabetes low-carb treatment, um, Dr. Bernstein. And, um, and, and I also thought that we would include, and, and this is very different, I came to Dr. Bernstein uh, from the type one uh, perspective, as, as you guys know, I'm an endocrinologist and I treat both type one and type two, but uh, Dr. Bernstein has always been my uh, role model for type one. But, but uh, as I found out, a lot, a lot of people who are type two are also influenced by him in a very significant way. So then I said, okay, let's do a panel that includes uh, three different types of people. Uh, first of all, uh, a veteran diabetic who's had diabetes for years and years and years. I'll let each of you introduce yourselves, okay? Um, um, somebody who has been recently diagnosed with type two diabetes and started the diet. And then a type one diabetic, meaning really the opposite disease because in type two diabetes, we have too much insulin. In type one diabetes, we have no insulin or very, very little insulin. And so really type one and type two are opposite sides of the spectrum, yet the solution seems to be quite similar in both cases. So let me just start off by introducing uh, Dr. Bernstein himself. Uh, Woo! Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, I want, would like to say that it was good to see Sarah Hallberg. 
uh, albeit digitally. Um, I have a few corrections to make. I've, been, I've had type 1 diabetes a lot longer than 34 years. It's been, so, this year is 70, the fifth, 75th year. Yes. Um, I'm now, uh, I'll be 80. You're an inspiration for all of us. <laughs> uh, so that's number one correction. Uh, the other correction is that um, the, uh, although the ADA has a cutoff point of diabetes of a hemoglobin A1C of something like 6.7%, which is an average blood sugar of about 160, that is really about double the optimum blood sugar in terms of uh, maximum lifespan, uh, which would be around 83 milligrams per deciliter. So saying that a per that you've cured diabetes if you get the uh, A1C into a range that the ADA likes is not, uh, achieving normal blood sugars. Um, and uh, just to show you what can be done typically in a type two diabetic, I happen to have spoken to this guy yesterday and um, here is his data sheet from the past week. Oh, we can't see that unfortunately. Okay, well, his yeah, blood sugars are in the 70s and 80s. And he submits, uh, and I did uh, a lab report on him, uh, which may be visible. The A1C was um, 4.9, uh, which means that his average is under 100 milligrams per deciliter. He and his wife were having a contest. They're both type two diabetics. Uh, they both lost weight. Uh, they both, like almost 100% of the type 2 diabetics whom I see require a little bit of insulin. Uh, the insulin they get is diluted. So um, they, uh, uh, they're taking, they, I think they both receive maybe one unit of a long-acting insulin once a day, placebo insulin, a small amount. Um, Maybe it's a half a unit, and they receive a small amount of diluted insulin that might total of the order of a unit or three quarters of a unit before uh, meals. So uh, they, although they've been on a low carbohydrate diet, have lost weight, have now normal weights, um, they still require a little bit of insulin. Are these diabetics that have had type two for a really long time? How long? How many years have they had diabetes? Yeah, they've had they've had it a long time, um, but uh, it's very rare that I'll find even a new type two where we can get away with um, absolutely no insulin and keep their blood sugars in the seventies uh, or eighties. I have one to introduce you to. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear you. I said, I, I want to introduce you to one who has an oh. A1. Yes, he's on the screen with us. Oh, <laughs> that, that, us. That, that's great. Hi. Uh, um, with the type twos, you rarely catch them at the beginning because it comes in so slowly. They, they may have had it for many years. Too if many years. Any symptoms. Right. The, most, the most common symptom is what you see in women. Uh, they, they'll complain of vaginal yeast infections. And that's the tip off, especially if they're overweight. Um, in men, it takes, a, it takes much longer. Uh, they might have one of the neuropathies and they might have the diabetes twice as long as three times as long as a woman before it gets picked up. Um, uh, their symptom might be uh, most commonly erectile dysfunction. Um, so uh, type two comes on very slowly. And uh, usually when I examine uh, a supposedly new type two diabetic, I'll get at least 15 
physical signs on physical examination of long-term high blood sugars, not sky high, not enough to make you thirsty and peeing a lot, uh, just enough to gradually cause complications. So what A1C do you aim for in your patient? Uh, I, I shoot for under five. Okay. Now, not all of them get there. Uh, if they don't, it's usually because of mistakes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, this man and his wife are having a contest. Mm -hmm. And she is 5.0, and he's now 4.9. Now, but she's at a disadvantage because she had um, uh, surgery, in a, I, I think it was inappropriate surgery for a diabetic frozen shoulder that has made it hard for, she can't have exercise uh, one, one arm uh, until she's fully healed. And she happened to uh, have been, I believe in a motor vehicle accident and fractured the other arm. So she can't do upper body exercises. So is exercise a big part of the treatment? And in, in her case, um, to help, she's on a very low carbohydrate diet. She doesn't eat that much, but um, I feel she needs exercise to get the weight down all the way. And um, also to get the blood sugars uh, uh, really into the range we want. Um, are you treating uh, them with any other medications? What what other medications are they no, taking? They're, they're both getting they're both getting metformin, um, and they're getting these minute amounts of insulin. Um, that's the story right now. I happen to pick this selection because I spoke to him yesterday, and we had his chart still out, not put away yet, and we could uh, photocopy his data sheets. Um, that's there's another common misapprehension, and that is that fat, protein, and perhaps other nutrients cannot raise blood sugar in diabetics. And uh, I had observed this that they do that they do raise blood sugar many, many years ago. And in my very first book, which was published in 1982, I, ref I called it the Chinese restaurant effect because I had observed that if I went to a Chinese restaurant and had um, uh, a big uh, salad of just chopped vegetables without any dressing, my blood sugar would go up to 300. Um, and that's an awful lot of blood sugar increase for something with, um, with close to zero carbohydrate. And um, I didn't know why this was happening until I read about um, GLP-1. Um, GLP-1 is a hormone that the intestines make and secrete into the bloodstream when anything enters the duodenum or the intestines. And that includes anything that distends the intestines. So any nutrient, anything with calories, any protein, fat, carbohydrate, um, and anything that distends the intestines will cause the production of GLP-1. GLP-1 tells the body to make insulin. It says, hey, there's food down here. Start making insulin before this guy's blood sugar goes up. But uh, does anyone here know, aside from Dave Dykeman, whom I've spoken to, does anyone here uh, know how much one unit of human insulin would lower your blood sugar? It depends on the person, right? <laughs> yes, but in what order of magnitude? Well, if, if you're very insulin sensitive, then one unit might drop you a hundred points. 
100 milligrams per deciliter. If you're a, a obese type two, you maybe even 10. So it depends. Okay. But you're talking about insulin out of a bottle. Okay. You're not talking about human insulin. Insulin out of a bottle is diluted 25 fold. So if one unit would lower you 100 points, the pure insulin that you make endogenously would lower you by 2,500. So human insulin is a potential killer. The body has to do something to offset that horrendous effect of just a little bit of human insulin. And what does it do in response to GLP-1? It makes glucagon. Not only that, uh, if it weren't for the GLP-1, the glucagon that it makes would be extremely potent. But the glucagon one causes the beta cells to make another hormone. Oh, gee, what's the name of it? What, what, did, what did you say? Somatostatin. No, not provostatin. Um, no, uh, 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 um, uh, the, the generic name is Simlin. Oh, amylin. Um, amylin. Am 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 amylin. Okay. Amylin does a lot of things. GLP-1 tells the pancreas the same beta cells that make insulin to make amylin. And amylin weakens the body's response to glucagon, makes us much less sensitive to glucagon, so that the weak glucagon produced in a large amount can offset the little bit of insulin, that, highly potent insulin, to fine tune the insulin. Just like on a shortwave radio, you make a lot of turns of the fine tuning knob to get on the station. Uh, here you're making a lot of weak glucagon to offset a little bit of insulin to fine tune your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. However, if you're diabetic, you don't have beta cells in the, in the extreme, a type one diabetic. You therefore, number one, cannot make insulin but number two, you have alpha cells that still make glucagon. And since you're not making amylin because you don't have beta cells, you cannot weaken the glucagon. So now in response to that GLP-1, you're making full strength glucagon, which is going to raise your blood sugar. So all you have to do is swallow a handful of pebbles, distend your gut with the pebbles, or you can uh, put a tube down into the intestines and pump up, pump them up with air, and your blood sugar will go up. This is important information to know about because it affects the treatment of the diabetes. Do you use amylin in your treatment? Um, I don't. I, I did use it um, experimentally, but there's another problem with amylin. It slows gastric, it does many things to improve blood sugar. And one of the things it does is it slows gastric emptying and slows digestion so that uh, in, in the ancient days when the guys on the block down to woolly mammoths and they thought they were gonna be able to eat the whole thing, as soon as they distended their gut, digestion slowed and they wouldn't be able to eat the whole thing, which they wanted to do because they didn't want the guys on the next block to eat it all up before they could finish it. So um, here we have uh, amylin slowing digestion. And it turns out that most long-term diabetics have gastroparesis, which is another very important subject that most doctors don't think about. And to have gastroparesis, which involves erratically slowed digestion and therefore erratic blood sugar response to food, you're now slowing it even further with the amylin. So um, uh, instead of amylin, what I have used on overeaters, uh, one of the other things that amylin does is cause, cause satiety. 
curbs the appetite. And for overeaters, I frequently use GLP-1 in order to indirectly stimulate your own amylin production. And um, it's frequently, but not always effective at curbing overeating. Yeah, do you use it for both type one and type two? Yes. Right. All well, right. Let's it's interesting that the GLP-1 agonists of which there are several, um, uh, if you look at the studies of their effectiveness, the effectiveness for one might be, one report might show it lowers A1C 0 0.5, which is lowers the average blood sugar by maybe 20. And if their blood sugar is a 300, that, that's worthless. Uh, uh, at the upper extreme, maybe uh, one of these things will lower A1C by 1.2. But the bulk of that effect is not the direct effect. It's the effect on appetite. So if you simultaneously put them on a low carbohydrate diet, you could have an A1C reduction of five. Let's say they're, eight, they're uh, nine you, uh, or 10, you bring them down to five um, just by curbing the appetite and eating less carbohydrate. How about 10.9 to 4.8 in three minds? In three months. <laughs> you you cut your carbohydrate and you went to four point eight. In three months, from ten from ten point nine. Yes, the with type two diabetes, the most important thing is what you eat. Yeah, or uh, or don't eat. The, the the host of medications that are sold for type two diabetes are trivial in comparison to the proper diet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me introduce uh, Dave. I, I will, let's, Dave, you're a patient of, of Dr. Bernstein, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm a patient. I'm a victim. <laughs> I'm a victim. Um, so let's hear it from the other side. It's very easy to give instructions, but then to be on the other side is, is where the challenge is. Um, you tell us about yourself. You've, you've had diabetes since you tell us your story. So I was, um, in third grade and at that time we were doing a big, uh, class thing and I was just became really sick. We didn't know what it was. I, you know, the basic symptoms of every type one diabetic that is diagnosed. Um, and then through that, we went to the hospital and had pretty much the same trajectory that was lined up with current guidelines, um, for every type one diabetic, uh, 30 carbs per meal. Um, high insulin, high carb. Um, and then it wasn't until about two months later where we really saw the, the effects that what it was having on my blood sugars where I would spike up to 200 and then crash down to 60 and be riding this roller coaster constantly that we, by luck, um, found Dr. Bernstein's book. Um, we ordered it and then we read the whole thing and everything just clicked in our heads. Um, so then we started to follow that and instantly the numbers became better. Um, the stress levels went down of dealing with this, um, the comfort went up and along that line, we came into contact with Dr. Bernstein and we've been, um, in contact ever since I'm working as an intern now. It's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, and yeah, he, he helped change our lives. Now, one thing that I didn't mention, but would certainly help you is that, uh, high blood sugars are toxic to beta cells. There are many reports that demonstrate this. And um, uh, if you catch the disease very early, including type one diabetes, uh, you prevent beta cell burnout. And uh, I've had a number, I, not a large number because uh, for me to be there at the time of diagnosis of a type one is pretty rare. It's a rare disease and um, I usually don't see the type ones until they've had it for a while, for a long time. But I do have several cases where I made the diagnosis or they came to me right after the diagnosis. And there we've extended their insulin production for many years. Uh, the longest is a lady who I diagnosed in 1985. Um, 
She had a sister with type 1 diabetes diagnosed at age 7. This lady was age 40. And she had a blood sugar, I think, of 650. Uh, I made the diagnosis. Uh, they caught me early because I was a friend of the family. And um, she ended up on something like 12 units of insulin a day, which uh, where for someone her size, a non-diabetic would be making about 20 units a day. And she's been at that dose of 12 units ever since. That's interesting. Do you, do you try anything else in new, in new type ones? Uh, you try giving them others, you know, may, there's some small studies giving DPP-4s that might improve uh, beta cell function and, and stop the autoimmune attack. There are other studies uh, also using GLP-1 injections. There are some uh, interesting things about vitamin D. I, I do any of these? Um, well, well, first of all, there have repeated, been repeated studies of vitamin D and um, they repeatedly say that type 2 diabetics tend to have low vitamin D levels. Um, but when they give them replacement, most of the studies show no difference in the status of their disease. Um, however, they do show uh, improved longevity when you give them vitamin D supplements. Really? I wonder how they show that because that's a very hard study to do. Well, these are long-term studies. Okay, I've not seen that study. Um, uh, but on the DPP-4, um, I'm trying to remember why I either stopped, I think I stopped using them um, and I forgot the reason why. Maybe because we got pancreatitis a couple of times. Um, that may be the reason. That's scary. Uh, or there may have been an association with cancer. Um, and the effects that I saw were trivial, the blood sugar effects. Um, so I abandoned the DPP-4. You could look, at, look it up for side effects. There, I had a good reason for... Uh, uh, Using, no, right. using them there's very a, briefly. There's a very, very slight increase in pancreatitis. It's still not 100% um, um, can't be associated with it, indeed. Well, um, I have seen three cases of pancreatitis, and uh, I've only been using, and by the way, the GLP-1 agonist can also cause pancreatitis. Um, and uh, I have one patient who's uh, an overeater, one of my few hopeless overeaters, guy where I haven't licked it yet. Um, and um, we've used GLP-1 agonists with him and it's worked, but he did get, uh, gradually got pancreatitis. So we had to abandon them. Wow, it's so painful when they, because it's such an effective medication in many ways, but the best of course is to be without medication. But Nina, let's hear your story. Uh, because you are on GLP-1, and, and one of the reasons we have to use GLP-1s is because, this is authentic, is because, is because we didn't catch the diabetes at the beginning, right? So please, please tell us your story, which is a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you. Oh, no. You're oh, on wait, no, I'm not talking. That's why you didn't oh, hear no. me. Uh, now, um, wait, what else do second. I do to try to preserve beta cell function? There was a study done uh, at the University of Alabama in Birmingham that's been reported where they give um, uh, an antihypertensive agent. Verapamil, verapamil. Verapamil, right. And I have several children on verapamil. Uh -huh. um, now, because I'm doing several things to preserve their beta cells, I don't know if the verapamil is working or not. Uh, because one of the other things I'm doing might be preserving them. And um, do they not get high? Do they it's, not not get any, it's not hurting them. But what They're about, not, I mean, I would, lots of times I, I would like to try verapamil, but if the patient has very good blood pressure, I don't want to give it to them because I'm afraid that they're going to crash with low blood pressure. You don't have that problem with the children? No, not, not at all. Okay. But, you know, the, uh, one may come along who does have a problem. 
there also has been um, one study that showed that that class of drugs that includes nifedipine, verapamil, um, and a few others um, uh, cause certain cancers. It was one study and um, you, we were waiting to see repeats uh, because um, uh, it, it should have been more obvious because it's so widely used. Um, so if that turns out to be true, I'll kill the use of verapamil. That'll be very easy. But Nina, can you turn on your microphone? Because we you're on mute. It's on mute. You no, don't no, hear. You, you don't hear me. Can you okay. turn, turn on wait. your microphone? Because we want to hear you. Wait, wait a second. Just a minute. Um. No, no, no. We're you're Dr. Bernstein. We can hear you. You're fine. Don't don't touch anything. We're good. I just want to. Oh. I just want to hear Nina's story um, because she's she's had diabetes for over 35 years. But since she discovered low carb, Pinina, can you hear me? You have to unmute somehow. There's a there's a mic. Yeah, we can't hear you. But you don't know how. No, oh, that's too bad. Control A on if you're using a computer, control A hit once will unmute you. <laughs> You see, he's going to guide you all the way. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Well, if you, hit it, if you hit it twice, it'll mute you. Anyway, well, I'll, let's see if you guys can figure it out. In the meantime, let's move over to Nico a little bit. And, and let me ask you, Nico. Yeah. You, you were diagnosed. You right away started. Um, on this diet, which was a really crazy story for us, right? Because the funny story with Nico is that I, I his dad was my patient. And uh, I'll never ever forget this day because Nico, you were actually the first patient I treated with type one, with, uh, with this diet. Yeah, type two diabetes with a, a ketogenic diet from uh, A1C 10.9 to 4.8 in three months. Yes, that was great. And, and the, it was just really fun because your dad had been my patient for a long time, and he was a well-treated uh, patient in the old sense. Well-treated, yeah. Exactly. He had, uh, you know, six shots of insulin a day and a ton of other medications on board. And when he brought you in... And Manage I diabetes. Manage diabetes. So then you started... You, you both looked at me like I was crazy, and I was like... You yeah. are crazy. <laughs> It is true. I'm still crazy. So How can you treat diabetes with me, with a, a food and not medicine? So, Nico, what, what have you done? How has your path been? And how how are you doing after? It's already been four years of this, right? Five. Five years. Yeah, we have one year of, a, a, you know, coronavirus. So we don't count it, but it's a full year. It's five years. Yeah. Um, so I was... How are you keeping it? How are you? I doing? was diagnosed with a, a, a diabetes, type 2 diabetes, five years ago. Uh, but about uh, um, I, I made the the blood the blood blood test so uh, and and I got the the test and and the doctor my my doctor said that well you have diabetes you have an A one C of ten point nine so we can manage it by uh, administering a, a lot of uh, medicine and administering um, you know insulin. And we can manage the disease, so you you, you can have an 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 A one C of uh, six point five seven, and uh, we can manage it. And you you won't have uh, eye disease, or we, we won't have to amputate your hands or your legs for uh, a few years. And I told her, what? I, I want to think about it, so I, I went home and I didn't tell anybody about it, not my parents, not my wife, not my kids, and I, I, I stayed home and, you know, it was in my mind and, and I said, what, 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 what can I do? So I went to my father, who's on uh, uh, type 2 diabetes for uh, all, almost four years, and, and I told him, when, well, you're a type 2 diabetes. I'm now a type 2 diabetes. We're like 
Fala and San, and I said, "Well, you're stupid. What? Why? Why did? Why did you 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 wait to 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 build this uh, a time to 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 make a, a difference?" And he went, uh, "Well, well, well. I'll take you to my doctor, my my endo, uh, to Mariella, and we'll see what she can do." And I went to your office, and you explained about the the disease, and uh, you told me. Well, your A1C is this high, and we need to take it this high. And well, all you have to do is go low carb and high fat, and you'll be okay. So I told you, okay, so I'll be um, diabetes free, but you'll kill me with my cholesterol. And you said, <laughs> no, no, no. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Yes, but you have to un uh, turn something else off. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Switch computers. Good, great. No. Wait, and now I can't hear you, Nico. Now, Nico, you're off. You're on mute. Now, can you hear me? So, basically, you started this diet, and you also started... Um, I started the diet, but before that, I read a lot. I, I, I went uh, to a lot of uh, um, internet sites and I read what it means to do a ketogenic diet. And I read Dr. Bernstein's uh, book and I saw that uh, there's a lot of information that we knew a lot of years ago, but nobody did anything about it. And if I, woke, if, if I could have been a 12-year-old, a, a fat, a fat 12-year-old, and read his book a long, time ago, a long time ago, I could have been a, a, a thin 12-year-old and never could have been a, a two-type a two, a two diabetic. And, 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 and it's, it's something that blow, blows my mind. Yeah. It's, it's, now, you mentioned... Ketogenic diet. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Now, yeah. Just I, uh, the ketogenic diet, um, but Dr. Bernstein is really not ketogenic. So this is kind of an interesting uh, point here. The, 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 both of the ketogenic diet and I guess we'll call it the Bernstein diet are both low low carb, but the difference would be that Dr. Bernstein, you're not a big fan of increasing the fat, from my understanding. You're more uh, a high protein. Uh, uh, a, high protein and whatever fat comes along with it. Um, okay. Basically, if you want to uh, have a philosophical reason why, it would be to uh, emulate uh, evolution of humanity. Um, our, our ancestors did not selectively remove the fat from animals and leave the protein behind. They ate what was there. And uh, what was there included protein and fat. Um, that's basically it. Uh, I th we need protein to build our muscle mass. And especially if you're prescribing exercise in addition to uh, uh, insulin for type one diabetics or exercise for anybody, they need protein to uh, replace the muscle that they're destroying. But if you um, want to, to treat type 2 diabetic and type 1 diabetic, do, do you see a difference in the uh, pers prescription, prescription and in the diet? Um, what I do when I, <clears throat> when I work out <clears throat> a meal plan for any type of diabetic, I estimate, the first thing I do is estimate their protein needs. Um, there are guidelines for how much protein uh, in terms of grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, an individual who's totally sedentary needs, uh, how much an infant needs, how much uh, uh, there are speculations as to how much a professional athlete needs. And based upon the act, I always get an exercise history of the patient. And I also um, uh, eventually make an exercise plan for the patient, but
but I say to the patient at the start, you're going to continue with your current exercise and we're going to base your protein intake upon your current level of exercise. And I then convert that grams per kilogram into ounces per day. And we then distribute the protein over uh, usually three meals per day. And um, uh, if they have gastroparesis, which I can determine a variety of ways, um, if they have gastroparesis, we minimize the protein at the dinner meal, make it a much smaller meal than the other meals because digestion is slowest at uh, dinner time for everybody. Um, so I start with the protein and then I uh, fit in the carbohydrates with low carbohydrate vegetables of which there are many available. And when I deal with people from South America, there are many more vegetables that they know about than what I know about. Um, they come anyway, from cows. Um, uh, we start with the protein. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, a question. For a type 2, di two, for a type two diabetic, if we, uh, for me uh, uh, especially, it took me three months with a, a high fat and low carb di uh, diet. I didn't uh, count uh, for the uh, um, for the. Um, you weren't counting the calories. I, I was. I was counting the calories or the chalbon. Uh, the protein. The proteins, and uh, I, I. It took me only three months to go from an A1C of ten point nine to four point eight. And uh, I, I kept about it for uh, about five years. So wh why do I need to count the, the, the proteins? Why, why can't I only do the high fat and low uh, carb uh, uh, diet? Uh, first of all, if you're a type two and making insulin, your body may, may count them and take account of them. If you're a type one, or if you're using insulin, um, you have to uh, cover everything you're eating with the insulin. Uh, you can't uh, take the ADA pretense that you only uh, uh, count the carbohydrate. This is one of the many reasons why insulin pumps don't work because the, the makers of the pumps have you uh, tell the uh, pump to give you a bolus of insulin for a meal based upon the amount of carbohydrate you're eating and they ignore the rest of the meal. And what we see is that you just don't get normal blood sugars. So we, we can say that it's a, ma that it's a major uh, difference between, between uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetic. Is the amount of insulin that you make. Dave, can you tell us? Most, mo most type ones, by the time they've had it, well, most type ones, after they've had it a few years, they've destroyed all their beta cells. They don't make any insulin. Type twos usually make insulin for a fairly long time, but eventually the high blood sugars that they usually have destroys the rest of the beta cells. That's also a reason why not to use a class of drugs called sulfonylureas, which um, are the, back, the ADA's backup after um, metformin uh, because the sulfonylureas and newer drugs that are similar to the sulfonylureas uh, cause the beta cells to make more insulin. And if you take a beta cell that already is uh, not producing enough insulin uh, to keep blood sugars normal and then telling it to make more insulin and artificially pushing it, you uh, speedily destroy the beta cells. That's why the manufacturers of the sulfonylureas warn you that they may not work for more than two years. The real reason is that they've destroyed all the beta cells that they're depending on. <laughs> 
So yeah. what would you recommend a type a newly type 2 diabetic instead of uh, in the to, to uh, in, in instead of a, a type 1 type diabetic I I look at their blood sugar profiles um, I showed you what the profiles look like that I look I have a data sheet the data sheet is interest is available for free to On the um, type 1 grit website uh, and uh, before I will treat a new patient I want him to bring me two weeks of blood sugars on his old regimen and then uh, based upon what I and, and he also tells me what he's eating and what medications he's taking and so on and so forth and um, I'll I uh, guess, At what medications he needs based upon uh, what I see of the initial blood sugars but my initial guess is always I always shoot for too little I'd rather than be a little too high than uh, hypoglycemic and I see a, maybe a few days worth of data on a new um, diet and my guess as to the medications I then I Uh, adjust things as rapidly as possible so they may be on a combination of metformin and insulin they may be just on metformin at the start they may be on metformin insulin plus a GLP1 to curb their appetite um, uh, it's all trial and error so diabetes this is treatable it's it's very personalized and Each person is different. I want to hear from, uh, from <laughs> Nina who hasn't said anything yet. Nina, I want, I want to Before hear... we get there, I want to address the mention of amputations. There's a big myth about amputations that they just happen to you if you have high blood sugars. I was director... <clears throat> Of the peripheral vascular disease clinic at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and I worked in this clinic for 35 years now it was 27 years in any event uh, I into from the very beginning I interviewed every new patient that we saw and we would get patients who had a leg amputated and they were coming to our clinic to uh, take care of the other foot, the foot that they still had. And I would ask them, what led to this? What was the first event in the sequence that led to your amputation? You must have had some kind of injury. What was the injury? And in 100% of the cases, the injury was someone trying to remove a callus. usually a podiatrist. Sometimes it was the patient themselves. Sometimes it was a family member. <clears throat> But in 100% of the cases over 27 years, it was someone trying to remove a callus. Okay, that's and, a good lesson. And uh, what would happen is they'd, <laughs> they'd go a little too far, um, cause a minor wound because of the high blood sugars The wound be, would become infected and then the treatment of the wound would be usually inappropriate uh, I won't go into the details of how you treat a wound without making it worse unless someone asked me to, do, to go into that but what I saw was that a hundred percent of the amputations in a major New York City hospital were caused by attempts to remove calluses and the This uh, effort by physicians is still in process. For example, this year, um, I'm sorry, last year, in the year 2000, there was a patient page. The last page of Journal of the American Medical Association is intended for patients. And uh, it's talking about amputations in diabetics. And it says that the major cause of amputations is calluses and that they should all be removed 
well, the major cause of amputations is removal of calluses. That's a, wow. a very important editorial. Yeah. Well, let me let me. Uh, I want to just uh, divert because we're actually running out of time. And I really want to hear from all of you. So uh, Dave, who, who is in Hawaii, okay, all the way on the other side of the world from us, and I, I totally appreciate you waking up early to be with us. I want to hear what, uh, you know, what it's like, because the amount of criticism that we hear uh, for children being treated with a low-carb diet is so, is, is so significant. So I want to hear what your experience has been like and... And you know what it's like to be a teenager going out to eat pizza with your friends and not eating that pizza. And how do you feel about that? And how do you feel when you break that? And do you cheat, etc.? Give us, give us, tell us more about your experience. Um, so it, it'd be even weird to to say it's I'm being treated with it because it's really just a different diet. It, it, all it is, it, it's it's really simple. It's just you know not eating bread and not eating uh, cupcakes, and that's that's pretty much all it comes down to. Um, you know, lunch is ham and cheese and no one cares and I'll eat a, a steak or some vegetables for dinner. It, it's, it's really not once, once you spend a couple months through it, it, it becomes so much of a non-factor of a thing that you don't even worry about it. Um, if I'm out with my friends and we're all getting pizza, I'll just take off the cheese and eat that. Um, so there's pretty much a workaround you can do for any single situation you could put yourself in. And after, you know, doing it for as long as I have at this point. Um, even though that's not for a very long time, it, it's, it's just locked in already. So it's really not much of a problem at all. And, and cheating is also something that I've never had to worry about. Um, I know it's, it's, it's an anecdotal and, and other people have problems with that. But uh, like I said a couple seconds ago, it's, it's, there's an alternative for almost any situation you can get into. So it it's really hasn't been a problem for me. So you really don't cheat ever? No, I never felt like I needed to. That's amazing. Honestly, that's really amazing. Especially because we know that when type ones cheat, quote unquote cheat, then their sugar is actually much much higher than it would have right. been in food, right? So, um, so it's it's very interesting. Well, when you're like such an inspiration, what about uh, your 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 um, growth? Was it ever affected by this? Um, well, I'm uh, I'm six one right now, and I'm uh, playing quarterback for our high school, so. Uh, I think it's almost helped me probably more than if I um, stayed on, you know, eating Starbucks cupcakes and, and muffins like I was before uh, <laughs> diagnosis or just normal, a normal um, kind of vanilla diet. That's and awesome. your sneakers are three feet long. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's really, really awesome. So that, that, I think you're such an inspiration for so many people. Um, Nina, if, well, Dave, as we're wrapping up, anything you'd like like to tell the people listening? Dave? This is, I'm still with Dave because uh, that way we can finish up with each one individually. Dave, anything else you'd like to tell everybody as a, um, as a closing thought? Sure, it's it's um it's just really possible. Um, big thank you to Dr. Bernstein uh, and thank you guys for having me on this in the first place. But the, the main thing is just, it's like really possible. And, and once you get over that initial learning curve, it's, it's very easy to do. And it removes a lot of stress from your day-to-day uh, -day life with, you know, being on the roller coaster, it takes that away. So it's yeah. very doable, it's very possible. Fabulous, fabulous. All right, Nina, let's move on to you. Let's hear your voice. <laughs> Hello, do you hear me? We sure do. So okay. <laughs> your story, your journey, and also, um, you know, why is, why is it a little bit harder maybe, uh, in some ways than others than other people who are just recently diagnosed? Well, uh, it started with me in, uh, gestational diabetes and after my last pregnancy, it just came back and stayed. So, uh, but, uh, when my youngest was about... You know, 10 years old, my physician said, your blood sugars are still too high with the, even with the, the glucophage, you'll have to go on insulin. And when I went on insulin, I gained 30 pounds. Uh, I was not, I was not thin beforehand and it was just devastating and nothing I could do would make it come off. It and it kept on getting worse. 
So uh, my my husband actually found me the ketogenic diet because I had really tried all kinds of things from the traditional calorie counting and exercise. And then we tried veganism for four months and it didn't do a thing for me. And after two months doing the, trying to do the ketogenic diet on my own, I came to you. Okay. And you said, if you don't get rid of that insulin, nothing will help. And so you took me off the insulin and this is, it's about three years now. Uh, I've lost about 35 kilo and uh, I feel good, although my blood sugars are not down where I would like them to be. Yeah. And I would have asked Dr. Bernstein about, you know, what does all that protein he, he eats do with the neoglucogenesis? Doesn't that, doesn't that increase the glucose? So yes. I, I don't have a problem since I'm keto. I don't have a problem with um, cravings. I don't have a problem with overeating for sure. I did a period where I fasted 40 hour fast and that seemed to give me a big push. That was towards the beginning of, of my uh, keto experience. And I am very, I am dumbfounded that people don't listen. <laughs> You know, I have friends say, well, how did you do it? I say, well, ketogenic diet. I, I tell them, you know, oh, no, I can't give up bread. I can't give up bread. And uh, so, you know, they can't. But I, I am very grateful that I found you and I found keto. And uh, and I do, um, I do Pilates with a personal trainer. So I've built some muscle mass. And it's I, uh, you were on like, how many units of insulin? I think maybe like 160, something yeah, like that. Well, something something like close that. to that, yeah. Yeah, units of insulin. So that's a real, that was a, that was a real insulin resistance right there, right? So right, sure. right. And and I had and I had I had a a low blood sugar reaction in the middle of the night, and by a miracle, my husband woke up and saw I wasn't breathing properly. He couldn't wake me up. He had to call. Him, we had to call an ambulance and by the time they came my daughter who's a physician started putting uh, I think honey on my tongue and I I revived but um but it was very scary and till I went on keto and you you told my him you well you never have to worry about that happening again uh he would he would not sleep all night <laughs> it's very scary hypoglycemia is very scary so, so uh, well, we we um we we know that um that uh, it's it's just a it's a big relief not to be on insulin for for so for type twos it's a it's really a, a no brainer the diet can really um not just get you off the roller coaster but also you know get you you don't have to you don't you don't even have to check your glucose levels if you didn't want to right because you're not, <laughs> not really at risk for having a hypoglycemia. Yeah. But All right, guys, I think we have to wrap it up. Um, does um, Nico, you want to say something to, as a finishing thoughts? Thank you for uh, Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Maria Grant for giving us the knowledge about the low carb and high fat uh, diet. So uh, we can, you know, be healthy. Everybody here is uh, healthier because of uh, your uh, 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 work, and we are all grateful for that. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Nico. We are we are um, we try. <laughs> <laughs> Do Dr. Bernstein, we'd like to finish up with you. Any parting thoughts? Any part? Any parting advice that you'd like to give? Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of parting information. <clears throat> Uh, in my experience, which is vast, I find that if a marriage partner has hypoglycemia at night, if the patient is the wife, the husband will never wake up. If the patient <laughs> is the husband, the wife always wakes up. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. I can tell you from my personal experience from my parents where, uh, where I call my mom the elbow because my dad is the one with type 1 diabetes and, uh, and she would know, she's been, I have to give kudos to my parents for an amazing journey. 
So you're right. <laughs> so um, we are um, going to wrap this up now. I want to really uh, thank everybody who's been partaking in this um, series with us and then join us for the Metabolics Conference. We're going to really try to do this every year and we want to meet you in person next year. Like we had so much fun last year. We want to do this again all together uh, and, and come back um, to hugging and enjoying and the energy that we get by being together. But um, this was also a great opportunity to just keep learning, even if we can't do it uh, without a screen. So uh, I want to also thank O Production and all our volunteers uh, who really worked very hard to make this happen. Um, and my co-founder, Ariel Shutrit, who really, I really thank them for being with me from the beginning. So guys, and uh, we'll be um, seeing you very soon. Keep up the great thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.